Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mechanical Engineering Departmental Series. Today, our speaker is Professor Matthew Valley from UIC. And I'm the host today on behalf of UFAN, who is on sabbatical now. Uh, I'm Sherif Atom. I think most of you know. <laughs> and yeah, so a brief uh, introduction. Um, and bio about Matt. Uh, professor Matthew Daly is, a, is currently an assistant professor uh, of materials engineering at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Prior to this appointment, um, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University and he received his PhD in materials science and engineering from the University of Illinois. 2017 and his bachelor, bachelor's and master's of applied science degrees in mechanical engineering from University of Waterloo. His research interests include the mechanics of nanostructured materials, advanced materials, and microstructure design, in situ characterization techniques, mechanical metallurgy, and atomistic modeling. Uh, among several accomplishments and awards, uh, a few of them are uh, Governor, Governor General of the Canada Gold Medal uh, for Research in 2012, uh, 2022 NSF Career Award, um, TMS uh, Young Leaders Professional Development Award, and several awards for teaching at UIC, such as Edmund Burke Faculty Award for Teaching Excellence, UIC College of Engineering Teaching Award in 2012, uh, in 2022. And before further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Professor Matthew Daly and to give his talk. So thank you, Sharife, so much for the kind introduction. Um, I, just before I get started, I wanted to thank um, both uh, Sharife and you for setting up uh, this wonderful day that I've spent here at Michigan so far. And thank you all for attending my talk. Um, just so I know, people online, I have no idea how far my voice is projecting. Uh, maybe a thumbs up, thumbs down if I'm coming through okay. I don't know if there's a way I can see the chat, but uh, okay, I saw some yeah. thumbs up. That's that's fantastic. Thank you. All right. So uh, I have to admit, when I was setting up this talk, uh, I was a bit intimidated because the mechanical engineering department is quite large. Uh, I saw almost 100 faculty, if I don't have that number incorrectly. So what I did is I just put a smorgasbord of the research topics that I've worked over the, on over the years, and I'm hoping that some of them matches your tastes. So just to give a this, since we've had a lot of questions about where UIC is and what UIC is, this is a Google Street View uh, overlay of where UIC is with respect to the most iconic landmark in Chicago, which is if you want to sound like you're from Chicago, you should say the Sears Tower, not the Willis Tower. So we're maybe about uh, half a mile to a mile southwest of the downtown. Uh, and my office is actually somewhere close to where that red arrow is pointing. And um, this is the view when I step outside. It's been photoshopped, not too much, but selectively panned so you can see what we kind of see on an everyday basis. And that, of course, is the Sears Tower on the right. So my lab at UIC, right now we're supported by five uh, sponsored projects. Uh, there's two pictures I've got here. One from our humble beginnings, and actually one of those members wasn't even part of the lab, he just came for the free lunch. That was in uh, 2018 when I started the lab with my first two PhD students. And uh, the, the image that you're seeing in the bottom there is from last spring, which is probably the high watermark in the lab with six PhD students, uh, three masters, and um, or two masters, and a number of undergraduate students, but more, many of them graduated and are now working at wonderful places at different companies, which I'm very happy about and they're very happy about. And so right now there's currently four PhD students and I've kind of rebooted the cycle of training in my lab. So that's uh, just a little brief history on what the lab looks like. So again, this is going to be a pretty broad talk uh, and hopefully that will spark some conversations for, for later on with people if they have questions. I don't have uh, many motivation slides, I just have one. And so I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. So uh, basically my interests in research are broadly uh, categorized in understanding defect mechanisms and the way they affect the mechanics of materials. So to illustrate that, uh, I've selected this image. Does anyone know what this is an image of? 
It's a Tesla, right? Uh, yeah, so it's, and this has become, the owner of this Tesla has become significantly more controversial since I first selected this image. <laughs> but, uh, so I might have to revisit this idea of using this image. But anyways, it's, it's a nice case in point of what I want to say about my research. So this is Elon Musk's cherry red Tesla. And back in 2018, I believe, it was shot up on a Falcon rocket from another company that he runs called SpaceX. And I'm not sure what the objective of doing this was, except to say I can send my car into outer space. And I think it's destined to Ju Jupiter or Saturn, something like that. But the point that I'm trying to say with regards to what inspires my research is in the foreground, you can see this automobile. And when you think about what this automobile is made of, it's, it's structural materials, right? So when we think about that concept in our mind, we want these materials to be reliable. We want them to be strong. If we're in, God forbid, some sort of accident, we want to be safe within these materials. But at the same time, when we think about this, and this is where the planetary backdrop kind of comes in, we also want these materials to be as lightweight as possible, right? We want to be able to drive our car further distances on the same tank of gas for both environmental reasons and also it's later better on the pocketbook. We want to be able to drive further on the same charge, but we don't want to compromise that safety. And in this very extreme case, we want to be able to send cars into outer space environments. Now, the more practical way of looking at this would be how do we actually do big engineering projects in outer space? We need to send materials out there. We need to design these materials. We want to be able to do this as efficiently as possible. So really what I'm doing in my research is an exercise of efficiency and understanding how we can optimize both mechanical properties without trading off safety, but at the same time doing this on a, on a weight budget. So there's a number of ways that we can do this, of course. Uh, the approach that I take in my lab is through this pathway of engineering deformation mechanisms. So this plot here will be meaningful to many people, hopefully in the audience, but I'll spend some time to explain it. It's actually going to resurrect itself later on in my talk. What you're seeing here is the basic property chart of uh, some steels that have been selected, y-axis elongation, how far we can stretch the material before it fails, x-axis strength, how hard it is to stretch the material to fail it. And what you can see is what we call this typical strength ductility trade-off. So these are low carbon steels, the property, of, or not necessarily low carbon, but the property of typical uh, steels being plotted out. So what you can see from this, this uh, curve is that we normally have steels that have high ductility, stretch them a lot, but at low strength, or we can have uh, high strength steels, but we cannot have the large ductility. But of course, that is not the story for people that are steeped in the metallurgy community. The, there are other things that we can do to the material in order to improve its properties and move outwards on this, um, in this up to the upper right hand quadrant of this plot. So improve both the strength and the ductility of these materials. And these have to do with changing the deformation mechanism by which they operate, transplanting this idea of dislocation slip, which dominates this normal strength ductility trade off with other mechanisms. And the one I'm showing here, two examples are deformation twinning, which I'll talk about later, and uh, Martin Siddick stress induced trade based transformations. So um, this is the major three themes that I'm going to be talking about in my talk. I hope I get enough time to talk about the last topic, which is science, kind of a pilot study that I'm working on in the lab, which has to do with um, studying vaporization and metal lab manufacturing. But the main thrust will be in these two areas. The first topic will be on understanding scaling laws for deformation mechanisms. And I'm going to talk about two examples under that larger umbrella one in 2D materials and one in metallic multilayer. So understanding what we can engineer about the length scale of these materials to uh, determine or to control how they fail at the macroscopic scale. And the example from the 2D world that I'm going to be selecting is the example of graphene oxide. So who here has heard of graphene? Yeah. It's this 2D material, this monolayer packing, uh, hexagonal packing of um, carbon atoms in a honeycomb lattice. And uh, it has length, it has width, but the thickness is a single atomic layer th uh, thick, right? Its strength, uh, as it's been measured, is the highest strength that we can see from all the engineering materials ever uh, previously studied. But, and that's all well and good, but the negative drawbacks of graphene is when you make it graphite. So one layer, graphene. As soon as you stack more than one layer, you get graphite. All of a sudden, you get this order of magnitude de decrease in the mechanical properties. And this is a log scale. So you're going from hundreds of GPA or 100 GPA all the way down to 100 megapascals. This is significant. And really what this has to fundamentally do is a shift from breaking in bond planes to interplane shearing mechanisms. But where we got interested based on previous work we had done in, in the lab and uh, work done by others is looking at graphene oxide. So graphene oxide has this similar trade-off where a single monolayer is very strong, not quite as strong as graphene, 
but significantly stronger than most engineering materials out there. And bulk graphite oxide has comparable properties to, to graphite. But the question that we were asking is, does it still have that scaling relationship where the properties degrade significantly after you add more than one layer on top of each other? So that's the question that we have moving forward. And the hypothesis behind this was that there should not be this exact same trade-off because the difference in the surface chemistry in graphene oxide is that it is populated by uh, functional groups that intercalate between the layers of the, uh, the graphene planes. So these functional groups come in forms of epoxide groups, hydroxyl groups, carboxyl, carboxyl groups, but really what they end up doing in the end is add cohesion to this uh, monolayer structure. And so the thought when we started this research was that this would be important in actually controlling the scale the scaling of the deformation mechanism, the scaling of the mechanical properties when compared to graphene. So how can you visualize the hierarchies of, um, you know, I'm gonna get this dot out of the way. Let's bring this over here. Some sort of lag, okay. Um, how can you visualize the hierarchies of the structure of graphite oxide? I've got this nice complicated image that I drew that made its way into a very fancy looking paper, but really the way I like to think about it is a deck of cards. One layer of graphene oxide is a card in the deck of cards. You can rip it, but it's stronger significantly than when you consider it against stacked cards in the deck of cards, which you can easily, if you've got a nice new brand new deck of cards, easily shear them off. And then bulk graphite oxide is uh, just many decks of cards haphazardly arranged together. So what we're interested in studying is that intermediary layer where we think all the magic happens, where we've got that deck of cards that's neatly stacked into this graphene oxide nanosheet. And I'll explain why that's important from practical aspects later on, but this is something that you can envision working at the length scale of 10 to 100 nanometers, or maybe tens to hundreds of layers of graphene oxide stacked on top of each other. So how do we go about doing this test? This is seems like it's difficult. Anyone that's done any film film mechanics here would know that you can't just go and grab it and pull it like you would in a conventional uh, Instron machine or MTS machine. How do you grip something that's that thin? It doesn't work. So we need to rely on what we call small scale mechanicals testing and specifically in situ mechanical testing. So um, this is an example of a MEMS thermal actuator device that was just constructed for this purpose. And I'll briefly just explain the operational concept, although I'm sure many people are familiar. There are certainly now uh, commercial uh, devices that uh, do the same thing at, uh, that are much easier and much less frustrating for grad students to develop. So you can always move with that if it's important to you. But basically this device is designed on a silicon wafer and it's uh, patterned, uh, lithographically patterned and then etched in order to reveal these structures. And the key features of this device are these beams here that you see, which are angled. And what happens is when you pass current through these beams because of uh, through these metallized contacts, when the current passes through this reduced cross section, you get an increase in the resistance and that will cause thermal expansion that will drive these shuttles where the sample will be positioned here in equal and opposite directions. And so if we can deposit a sample and fix it across that gap, uh, which we can do with liquid processing of graphene oxide, we can in, in a sense do a mechanical test, a uniaxial tensile test. And as long as the sample is not too thick relative to the thickness of the shuttles, we don't uh, induce any nasty out of plane bending moments that we may want to avoid. So this is an example of uh, the setup. This is an example of uh, an AFM image of a graphene oxide layer that's been deposited just to show you that we can get into that magic 10 to 100 nanometer range that we're interested in testing. So this is the setup. And then what we do is we take this and we put this inside the scanning electron microscope and we record the displacement of the shuttles uh, and we calibrate that against what the displacement of the shuttles would be versus no sample there to understand the load that's on the system. Uh, oops, wrong keyboard. So let's look at some data. And remember, the goals that we're looking at here is we want to understand what the strength of these materials are. And then we want to do a little bit more fundamental science behind this and understand maybe why they have this strength. So what you can see just looking at the tensile data plotted on the left is this is already encouraging. If you remember, the trade-off in graphene was this orders of magnitude decrease from GPA regime all the way down to megapascal regime. And while we do see some degradation in the mechanical properties of these nanosheets, it's still well into the GPA regime, which is significantly stronger than most engineering materials we have out there. So this is encouraging. This kind of satisfies that first question that we were asking is that there is, uh, while there might be a trade-off with uh, stacking these layers, it's not as significant as what you see in graphene. And in fact, as we'll show later, it kind of follows your typical Wavell analysis, where as you increase the volume of the material you're testing, because it's a brittle material, more likely to intercept a critical defect, which will then cause uh, a degradation, a slow degradation to the pulp behavior. The other key thing about this, because this is done in the microscope, is we can take some really interesting images. 
And the one thing that we were kind of scratching our heads about when we saw this was what we didn't understand while we understood this mechanical data find is why test after test, this stack of graphene oxide layers in this nano sheet would all fail from the same location. Because if you think about this, a naive assumption might be, okay, we've got a layer, it has a critical defect. We've got another layer on top of it. It has another critical defect from which uh, fracture should propagate. They should not necessarily be spatially correlated. So why do we see this kind of guillotine-like fracture, this global fracture localized across one uh, portion of the specimen? This was the question that we wanted to ask. And because this happens so fast, because this is a brittle fracture mechanism, we can't really resolve the crack propagation inside the uh, scanning electron microscope, at least not in this configuration or this setup. We can't notch that crack forward, right? So what do we do? Well, this is where we turn to another skill set that we have in my lab. We both do experiments and modeling we decided to build a molecular dynamics model. Now, I want to preface this by saying we're not trying to recreate the stress drain curve. There are inherent difficulties in doing that in molecular dynamics because of the abnormally high strain rates that you have to impose on a sample. What we're trying to understand is fracture propagation and the mechanisms associated with that. So you can see here what you're seeing in this image here is a cross section of a graphene oxide nanosheet made uh, to be simulated using a software called LAMPS, which runs molecular dynamics simulations. For people that are not familiar with LAMPS, or molecular dynamics, very simply how it works. Throw atoms up in space, just finding their XYZ positions, join those atoms together with springs, which you can define with an interatomic potential, and then evolve forward in Newtonian mechanics after applying some sort of boundary change to the system, whether stretching it or heating it up or whatever you want to do. This is the basic essence of molecular dynamics. And doing this over millions of atoms. Uh, so not something you can do by hand, but if you're really good at math, you might be able to, I don't know. So this is, this is the setup. And the system that we're considering here is a pre-cracked system. So what we're doing is we're introducing an edge crack into one of the layers in this stack and then performing a unaxial tensile test. And what we're doing is we're loading this sample all the way up to the point before the crack propagates, holding it, and just nudging that crack one step further to watch the propagation. And so the idea here is that all the layers are equally loaded in terms of isostrain condition, and we're just advancing that one critical crack across a single layer and watching what happens. Because the thought, and then again, this is arguable how accurate this is. We're not claiming to have all the answers for this. The argument though, is that snapback, that fracture process is something that's actually getting close to the time scale of what you would see in molecular dynamics because of the high elastic limit of these materials. So what we're doing here, you can see that process uh, metering out. You're seeing two layers in this multi-layer stack. The first layer is the layer that's pre-cracked with the functional groups just hidden and it's translucent. What you're seeing beyond that is the second layer, which has a color mapping associated with local strain. And lo and behold, what we see when we advance this crack through the system is we get another crack nucleating directly spatially located below, in the layer below or the layer above, as the case may be, from that initial crack that propagated across. And so the interpretation of what we're having, uh, saying is happening here is, and this is different than what you would see in, in um, graphene, is that fracture energy that's released when you crack at least that first layer, the elastic energy that's stored in that body, that pre-cracked layer, is being released through the functional groups in the layer below, and it's concentrating directly into the um, area directly below the crack. And so this is what's causing a self-repeating mechanism that can advance through the structure. So this is our interpretation. There are some ad ad admitted weaknesses in this approach to analyze, but we were relatively satisfied that we could explain this mechanism through this interpretation. And so, um, Looking back at the whole test data and how this kind of changes the conversation between what happens in the scaling of this deformation mechanism, we can understand that at the mono layer, we have an intraplanar fracture mechanism where we rip one layer, uh, one card in the deck of cards. At a nano sheet, what we have is we have that one crack that advances through and uh, that causes a network of cracks that is uh, spatially located at the, the position one critical flaw. And then finally, at the bulk scale, we kind of have a shearing of all the uh, mismatched um, decks of cards that we've got a range. And again, as I mentioned, we can see that the fracture strength intuitively scales with the increase in the volume of the material that we're actually testing, which is something you would expect from conventional wavelength analysis. And so why is this important from a practical standpoint beyond some interesting fracture mechanics that we might have been able to, to uh, realize is we can populate this space and we can say, okay, graphene oxide nanosheets are very strong, but also, I don't know if anyone, does anyone here do any 2D material synthesis? No? I'm not a synthesis person at all, but I know enough about it to know that making a monolayer in a mass fabrication that's is very difficult. Normally how you make monolayers is you do this scotch tape thing where you make little micron sized flakes and the yield is extremely low and you might get one out of a hundred that are actually monolayer. 
how do you make this graphene oxide nanosheets? We can solution process these. We basically take graphite oxide, throw it in a sonicator, throw it in a centrifuge, spin it around, and what comes out is graphite oxide nanosheets, something on the order of many, and it's a high yield. So this is something that you could see if you were thinking about a composite application, never as a monolithic structure on its own, being uh, amenable to some sort of reinforcement in a um, polymer, reinfor or a, um, a reinforced uh, polymer composite. Okay, so I have to keep an eye on the time. I tend to talk quite a bit. Second study, shifting away from 2D materials is now looking at scaling laws and metals. So just very, very briefly, and I'm gonna do a lot of hand wavy arguments, which makes me nervous here, but I don't have enough time to go through all the details of all the mechanics here. Basic, I, the, one of the fundamental scaling laws that we leverage in the strengthening of metals is the hull patch effect. So the very, 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 and this is a pervasive effect that uh, goes across a large uh, cross-section of metals. Um, the basic, basic idea is the grain boundary serves as a boundary to dislocation propagation. And the more grain boundaries, again, very hand wavy, this isn't exactly what happens, but the more grain boundaries that we put in the way of the dislocations, the higher you can push the yield strength of the material. And so basically, if you think about this material property selection diagram here on the right, we can move a lot up on the y-axis strength without adding any more density. Remember, I want to make materials strong without making them heavier, ideally making them lighter, but certainly not making them heavier because that's not very useful. Uh, the problem is, as many people will know, that this comes at the uh, trade-off of ductility because you're suppressing dislocation slip within this process by introducing all these boundaries. So what do you do, right? Now, this is where um, you get this idea to pursue this multi-layer concept. And I have to be honest, it was inspired by some of the room. Uh, the difference in the multi-layer concept that we uh, devise as, uh, as composed to the traditional multi-layer concept would, would be looking at dissimilar stack-ups of materials is what we're doing here when we're creating this multi-layer structure. This is a bulk structure, but we're modulating the grain size of the layer. So you can imagine building a structure made out of nanocrystal layer and a polycrystal layer, coarse grain layer, and then another nanocrystal layer. And what we can do, this is a pulsed electrodeposition process that we used to build these bulk sheets. You can see this in the cross section is almost a millimeter thick and has lateral dimensions the size of this table. It just depends how big your electrode is that you're depositing it on. What we do is by modulating the waveforms, we can control the grain size to some degree, but we can certainly control the thickness of these layers to a very good degree. And so you can see here some nice pretty SEM images that I took where we can actually see the bulk structure and as we zoom in, you can see the thickness of these layers coming into focus. And at the higher magnification, you can really get appreciation for the differences in crystal size in these backscattering images between the, these channeling backscattering images, I should say, between the coarse grain layer and the nanocrystal layer. So this is the uh, setup. And so um, the key references here, so there's a couple slides that I have key references on. If you're interested in learning more about it, it's all there. Uh, or you can, of course, ask me. Uh, we can now think about permuting a number of different combinations of thicknesses and perhaps even grain sizes of nanocrystal and coarse grain materials to map out the material property space. I'm only going to talk about two that we found that were particularly interesting, but of course there's more covered in uh, this paper. And so the first, which is more of a reference case, is what happens when the thickness of the coarse grain layer is much larger than the grain size of the coarse grain layer. And what we notice here in terms of mechanical properties is when we, and we're, I'm only going to consider strength here, ductility is a whole other consideration, and in uniaction tension, there's not much interesting to say about that. Um, and we're pulling along the horizontal axis of this board. When we look at the, the tensile properties of this material, what we find is that the multilayer, which is shown there in red, basically follows the rule of mixtures averaging of a fully nanocrystalline reference versus a fully coarse grain reference. It kind of basically follows what you would get if you just averaged up the volume fractions of these materials. Not particularly interesting, but useful as a benchmark. And when you look at the fractography, what you see is that kind of being played out, is you can see ductile failure mechanisms at different scales associated with rupture of the nanocrystalline layer and ductile rupture and coalescence of voids in the uh, polycrystalline layer. But these mechanisms are kind of operating independently. And so it's basically like we took two pieces of, this, of two different materials and glued them together, and the layering isn't really doing anything. It's just, I could have taken a big piece of nanocrystalline material and a big piece of coarse grain material, glued it together, pulled it, and gotten almost the same result in terms of mechanical property outcome. So that's the benchmark case. The more interesting question comes is to what happens when the thickness of the coarse grain layer is on the same order of the grain size. And the way you can think about this from a material design aspect is we have one squishy grain that is positioned in between very hard material. 
So you've got this one coarse grain that is surrounded by nanocrystalline material in this stack up, at least at the top and the bottom. And so what we notice when we pull these materials is that rule of mixtures completely breaks down. So the strength, again, not saying much about the ductility because there are some uh, other problems that play there in comparing that, um, the strength is, uh, fall, is way above what we get from rule of mixtures. And so we got interested in understanding why. And the thinking moving forward is there has to be something about the proximity of that nanocrystalline interface with that coarse grain material that's causing some sort of interaction between the mechanisms between these layers that is not captured in the other case. So what do we do? Again, the expertise in the lab is doing simulations and experiments. We build an electrodynamic simulation cell. Again, we are not claiming to recreate the stress strain curve. That's not something we can do with molecular dynamics at these time scales. So, and we can't even simulate all the atoms that we would want because of the computational cost. But what we can do, and uh, we're fairly certain that this is at least somewhat of a representative volume element of the setup, is take a small section of this cell, position nanocrystalline material, with a coarse grain layer in between, wrap it all in periodic boundary conditions and fill it with atoms, and then run a tensile test. And again, not interested in uh, matching quantitative results from experiments, but trying to see if there's any interesting mechanisms that we can see happening between these layers. And so I'm gonna let this run. What you're seeing here is a tensile simulation, so we're pulling horizontally, and the only thing you're seeing is the atoms that exist at some sort of defect. They're not perfect FCC atoms. This was an FCC alloy we were working on. Pulling, 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 and we get this whole mess of defects being created. Now, again, this is a little bit of a contrived setup, meaning we haven't uh, populated the coarse grain layer with all the complexities of Frank Reed sources that would be serving as intracrystalline plasticity mechanisms that we would normally expect in these materials. But what we do see, and the way we were thinking about this, is because we're pulling this as an isostrain situation, you've got a, a very, very hard material with a high elastic limit under a high amount of stress existing next to this very squishy material, this coarse grain material that has a significantly larger crystal size, is we see these this nucleation events of grain boundary uh, dislocations that create defect structures within the coarse grain material. And what are these defect structures when we analyze them? They're deformation twins. And that makes sense with this system that we're working on because it's a nickel cobalt alloy that has an inherently low stacking volt energy that's amenable to deformation twin formation. And what these deformation twins, which I'm going to talk more about later on in this talk in another area, what they do is effectively refine the crystal size and add more boundaries in that add this added strengthening. This is at least our interpretation of the defect structures that we see when we position this very squishy grain between this very hard material. Now, you might be asking yourself at this point, well, okay, this is all very well and good. Do you see any evidence of this in your experiments? So what we did was a very simple experiment, or what I should say, what I did was a very simple experiment. I took a Vickers indenter, which drives a high amount of plasticity. I was just trying to pump as much plasticity into this interface as possible. And I did two experiments. I positioned the indenter over the, the <laughs> coarse grain layer and did an indent and looked at the morphology of the structure afterwards. And then I did this exact same experiment in a coarse grain reference. And what I see zoomed in on the right is two different things. Here, we see twins where there were no twins before. So this is indication that we're actually are forming twins. And in the bulk coarse grain reference material, we see no twins. We see just model contrast associated with um, dislocation slip. I mean, there may be twins present, but they're not significant enough that we can see them at this scale, whereas they light up like a Christmas tree in this um, multi-layer reference. So this is some, let's say, indirect effort, uh, evidence that what we're seeing is the, um, is, is credible from our molecular dynamic simulations. So what do we do with this? What have we learned from this? Is that when you have very thick coarse grain layers, and you could think of this as being a broader comment on the idea of heterogeneous microstructures where you're not just having one very wide distribution of grain sizes, you're having two modulated grain sizes with their own grain size distributions. When the thickness of those layers is significantly larger than the crystal size, you do not see any crosstalk in the plasticity mechanisms. They're not significant enough that it shows up on a mechanical test. However, when you um, break that down and uh, that, that behavior breaks down when the thickness of the coarse grain layer is close to the crystal size, and you do see this crosstalk. And what we can do through a very simple cox mecking like model, which I don't have time to get into, it's a work hardening model that's used to um, predict the flow stress of um, materials that uh, that can take into account twinning behaviors and also uh, dislocation dislocation interactions is we can actually recapture the true uh, experimental behavior by adjusting our uh, work hardening model to, to accept this information. So that's the, the major outcome of that area. How am I doing on time? Oh, better than I thought. 
Okay, so bringing this now to the second main uh, theme that I wanted to present in this um, work is now looking not at more the mechanisms that lead to failure at the macro scale, it's more looking at the defect met metallurgy that fundamentally underpins competition between deformation mechanisms. And so this is where this chart is coming back. And what I wanted to understand broadly in um, this study of complex alloys, so we're looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at, I'm going to use the word high, high entropy alloys. I know that might be a bit triggering for some people in the community. What I mean is I mean alloys with multiple components with non-trivial amounts of second and third and fourth elements. Um, without getting into the nitty gritty discussions on what uh, that implication of that name might have on configurational entropy. And what we're going to be ultimately looking at is the uh, competition between two deformation mechanisms, slip and deformation twinning. And specifically what we're going to be looking at just as a review uh, for people, I'm sure many people are, are uh, familiar with slip and twinning, but if you'll indulge me, slip is, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could describe this and I've got this simple cartoon schematic here, but basically the way I like to think about it is it's a non-correlated operation of dislocations. So the dislocations move, they glide across slip planes, and when they leave the crystal, they, they move in a way that accommodates the far field deformation you're applying on the system, and they may uh, interact on different slip planes, but when they finally leave the crystal, the crystal structure is uh, undamaged, but there is macro flow of the material. Whereas in deformation twinning, it is completely coordinated. Deformation twins only nucleate and grow by a coordinated nucleation and progression of dislocations in a specific sequence across a sample. And because of the nitty gritty of this sequencing, what you're left with when these uh, uh, twinning partials leave this system is a unit cell and the unit cell has a rotated lattice. And you can see that across these deformation twin boundaries, which I'm kind of showing here, the unit cell has been completely <laughs> rotated to the near symmetry. So the key point here when we're talking about uh, mechanical properties is slip leaves you, even though, again, this is a very hand wavy single crystal, only how many atoms do I have here? 50, not representative of what happens in the bulk. Um, atoms, you're left with a perfect crystal, so quote unquote, and here you're left with a crystal with some defect uh, debris in it. So what does this do? How does deformation twinning affect work hardening? Well, there's two key features that I want to focus in on here. Of course, there are more, but basically the first part, which adds to strain hardening, meaning it's work hardening the material, adding to stress as you have strain, is your subdividing rate. So any dislocations that are incumbent on that deformation twin boundary will meet a very, very resistive boundary that it will be difficult for them to penetrate through. Again, first hand wavy approximations of what's going on here. The second effect is because it's dislocation mediated, it's contributing to plasticity. So it's also leading, leading to softening. And so if you think about these two balancing acts, you're hardening the material, but also softening at the same time. And I don't really have a good reason for this. And perhaps Professor Misra or someone else can correct me as to why this happens. But it gives you this magic effect that helps you avoid Considere's criterion, Considere's limit. So Considere's limit is a necking criterion, which says you, if your material cannot strain harden quicker than this rate, you're basically going to neck and fail. And the best way to avoid that or a strategy to avoid that is to have a linear work hardening rate. So you're building up stress in the material, but you're not building up so fast that you basically run into Considere's limit. This is the way I envision it. And deformation twinning, again, I don't have a perfect understanding uh, because it's quite complicated as why this is the case, but it leads in a, across a variety of systems, this nice flattening in the work hardening behavior that allows you to extend out plasticity. That's common across a couple different materials that I've looked at here and certainly others, but um, not so in materials that are dislocation mediated, which is like pure copper. So this is the key effect. And remember the whole goal of this um, part of the, the talk is to understand what's mediating competition between dislocation slip and deformation planning. And I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of the way I'm gonna analyze this, but we spend a lot of time in the group really understanding how to eliminate so many extrinsic effects of microstructure on this process and only focus on the fundamental defect metallurgy. So what do I mean when I'm talking about the fundamental defect met met uh, metallurgy? I mean the generalized planar fault energy curve or the generalized stacking fault energy curve, depending on the mechanism you're looking at. Many probably this curve is very familiar to people, but if you'll indulge me, I'll briefly explain it for people that may not be as familiar. Basically what this is uh, showing is x-axis is shearing of a lattice, y-axis is excess energy introduced into the system due to this process. And what you're seeing as you go over the minimums and maximums of these curves, these two curves, the dashed line being for twinning and the solid line being for a slip, is you're seeing the relative energy penalties that you're introducing into the material to introduce these defect structures. And so really 
ignoring all, not ignoring, but if you can find a way to cancel out and not consider or control for all the other effects of microstructure, whether it be grain boundaries, whether it be Schmidt factors from different uh, texturing, and only look at a very uh, contrived example, but meaningful example of this intrinsic difference in competition, you can study what makes something twin versus what makes it slip from an intrinsic metallurgy perspective. And so that's what we're going to do. So how do we do this? Um, this is going to be very computationally heavy part of the talk. So what we've developed in my group is a kinetic Monte Carlo method to track a variety of deformation mechanisms that are meaningful to this competition. What we've been able to do is populate this kinetic Monte Carlo model. So what you can think of this, and I have to say this was inspired by some other work I've seen uh, in the literature, but we've, I think, taken it to um, some into some new areas. Um, what, we, what you can imagine this kinetic Monte Carlo looking like on the right-hand side is this single crystal. It's been oriented in a way where Schmidt factors do not matter and they do not bias the mechanism for leading or, or trailing chocolate partial dislocations. Hopefully that language is meaningful to people. So that's how we control for some extrinsic factors. And um, that might creep into this analysis. And what we do is we set every single position on the left-hand side of this boundary as a potential nucleation site for a dislocation. We have some general understanding, although there are some imperfections in this analysis, of how the nucleation barriers can be derived from these planar fault energies, uh, which we have here. And then what we do is we throw our dice and run the simulation forward. And basically what we're doing is we're growing these defects and we're updating this model where the energy barriers are changing to reflect the defect history as you move along the slip barriers or the twinning barriers defined by this general planarized, uh, generalized planar fault energy curve. So um, again, just to re reiterate what we're doing, KMC model, treating every location on this model as a nucleation point on the left-hand side and glide points through the model, populating this model with barriers. These barriers are drawn from the generalized planar fault energy. So it's a completely intrinsic mapping uh, to deformation mechanisms between slip and twinning, and then we're throwing our dice and seeing what comes out. So um, that's the preamble. The results, here is the setup or the um, defect structures that emerge for uh, four common FCC metals for which these energies are very well known, these generalized planar fault energies, silver, gold, copper, and aluminum. And what you can see if you know much about this field is the expected behaviors. Every time you're seeing a, a colored stroke is the kinetic Monte Carlo has grown a defect at that point. If it's eliminated, that means a trailing partial has gone through the system and, and added to dislocation slip. And you can see we get these expected behaviors where something like silver has a high degree of twinning, copper, moderate twinning, and aluminum only extended plasticity. So we only have leading and trailing partials, which is what we expect uh, knowing about these materials. And so this is interesting because what we can do besides create these kind of toy examples is we can actually channel and count the amount of plasticity that gets partitioned between these two mechanisms of um, uh, deformation twinning and dislocation slip and their contributions to overall plasticity. So that's what you're seeing being plotted here on the right-hand side, that y-axis is twinning strains, the x-axis is total plastic strain. And um, this is useful and we hope will get adopted by someone at much higher scale, continuum scale, to be used to feed into some sort of crystal plasticity model where this would be meaningful to take this beyond this naive single crystal uh, simulation that we've done. So this is a couple slides on how this analysis has worked for pure elements. And again, I said this is going to be about concentrated alloys. So um, what's changes in the conversation when we think about concentrated systems? Uh, so again, just to, to reiterate what this is, we're talking about multi-component systems. So it could be two, three, four elements where there are non-trivial amounts of the secondary or tertiary elements in solid solution. And for the purposes of what I'm showing here, although we have some new data on ordered systems, we're looking at just randomly arranged um, high entropy alloys or concentrated systems. So what does this do? Well, you get this variable chemical environment where if you're a dislocation moving through a lattice, what you see is a constantly changing chemical environment. Maybe you have atoms A, B, and C in front of you, and then afterwards you have atoms B, B, and C in front of you as you glide through a lattice. So what this means is you've got this varying chemical environment, which leads to a varying potential energy landscape. And what this causes is fluctuations, local fluctuations in the, um, in the defect energies that are determinative in these plasticity mechanisms. And so what we're trying to understand is, is that meaningful in the way the kinetics evolve? Okay. So, how do we actually figure this out? Well, what we do is we go back to molecular dynamics and what we do is we start sampling because we need data to understand how big these fluctuations are. So we create this system where we introduce the defect that we're interested in studying and then we sample it 
add a volume that is meaningful to the um, uh, size scale of the defect that we're interested in. So in this case, we're interested in a dislocation, a 20 partial dislocation. So we can get some estimate, and it's not too sensitive to this, the, the results, as to how big of an area it interacts with meaningfully when it glides through a lattice. We can then collect statistics and then plot out the uh, planar fault energy curves uh, using what you're, you know, for example, what you're seeing here for a nickel cobalt system on the right, where the black is the average of the system and the green represents plus minus one standard deviation in the energies that we get from this sampling technique. Okay. So what do we do with this information now that we've captured this information of these statistics? Well, we can go back to our kinetic Monte Carlo method and we can inject this statistical information into the method in order to evolve forward these defects. So and do the exact same simulation. I should make this sound more novel than it was actually. We did a cunningly new simulation in this space. And what we're doing instead of just um, dealing with these static barriers that are updating with and tracking the deformation history of this crystal is we're now injecting statistical information here. So the barriers now have some meaningful statistics that are mapped to what we measured in molecular static simulation. So you can imagine that not only is the barrier being updated for some deformation process with respect to its history, it's plasticity history, it's also being updated with respect to the solute statistics that we've grabbed from molecular dynamic simulation or molecular static simulations. So um, what do we do? There's a lot of results. Again, um, I, on one of the slides that I hope are captured by this recording, there's a bunch of references or you can talk to me if you're interested in learning more about this. We ran two cases for this. Uh, we ran more, but this is the two I'll talk about. Y-axis on this plot is fault density. So just counting the number of defects per line in a segment length. And the x-axis is fault fraction. So these are uh, anything counts as a fault here, a stacking fault or a, um, um, an extended stacking fault uh, or extrinsic stacking fault or, or a mature twin. And we ran two use cases. We ran a case where we injected all the statistical information. That's the data in green. And then we ran a case in blue where we only put in the average barriers. We didn't add any statistical noise or statistics that are representative of the solute environment to it. And then we plotted out our, our data from our kinetic Monte Carlo forward um, and plotted that down. And then at this point, we thought, wouldn't this be nice if we could validate this in some way? Now, the best validation, of course, would be from experiments, um, but these are something we're trying to do right now. They are very difficult to do, as many people can probably appreciate. But what we were satisfied with at the time is doing molecular dynamics on a nanowire. Because <laughs> if you think about the nanowire configuration, it's actually very similar to what we're testing. It's a single crystal. It's got these, at least in a simulation sense, perfect boundaries that we can form in this nanowire uh, because we basically just cut it out of a single crystal. And then we can pull it. Now there are, again, we're not trying to map stress drain curves. We're not trying to do anything like that. Um, there are some arguable comments that you could make about the strain rates here, but again, we're only looking at the relative competition between mechanisms. So the way of thinking about this is, because uh, I had this uh, discussion with Professor Chi earlier about this, is, is this generalized planar fault energy curve strain rate dependent? And what we found is, at least our argu arguments across checking amongst a bunch of different strain rates is no. That's a simple way of putting it. So uh, we're, we're thinking that this effect is strain rate insensitive. Run the simulation, count the defect structures that, that um, uh, are created, map that against our data, and what we find is it actually matches very well with the statistical uh, method. So what we're showing here is that the fluctuations actually matter. And so this is, I think, meaning, meaningful level to be meaning, medium level. I think the most important point of this, uh, which I only realized after we went and submitted the paper, and I should have spent more time on actually, so maybe an idea for future work, is what we were able to do is we were able to show at which length scale the fluctuations don't matter anymore. So what you're seeing here is a twinability criterion that we developed in the group. I, I have a snapshot of it on the next slide. Um, there's a lot of math into it, um, which I uh, don't want that to be intimidating. If you're interested, please take a look at the paper. And what we're predicting here is the likelihood for a material to nucleate deformation twins or thicken existing twins, which is meaningful for looking at um, how twins chop up the microstructure. And what we've been able to do is show that as that sample box grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, so that A star that we've got there, basically the fluctuation behavior, the statistical behavior converges to the ball at somewhere 25 times what we were assuming our activation area was for our this location. So why is this meaningful? What this is showing is fluctuations matter, at least in the cases that we've studied, but they only matter if the length scale of, that your defect cares about maps to the length scale of the fluctuations 
So if you're talking about some, I don't know, giant precipitate that is much larger than the length of the solute, it's almost like a diffraction phenomenon. If it sees it or it doesn't see it, um, it may not be important. But if it's at the scale of the dislocation, which exists at the scale of solute to a certain degree, this can matter. So this is what we're trying to say. So um, this twinability criterion that I showed here, there are many of these in the literature. We have our own humble contribution to this literature. Uh, the, the basics go back way back to Tadmore in the early 2000s and, even, and Jim Rice even before that. Basically what it's telling you is, does is a material from a crack tip, that's the original analysis, likely to undergo twinning or slip? We've extended that to consider extended deformation. So not talking about the first nucleation event, but talking about subsequent nucleation events. So this is what this term is capturing here how the microstructure is being chopped up by the presence of twins. And the second part is similar to what we saw in previous uh, twinning criterion, at least in a, in a certain sense, is it the energetic penalties associated with twinning or slip. And what we've added and overlaid on top of this is the statistical noise. So the statistical noise, meaning how we should adapt these barriers, this comes from some ex expectation analysis that we have, expected value analysis that we have, where we are modifying the average value by adding in information about the standard deviation. And what you'll see importantly is that if standard devi deviation goes to zero, that you recover the average barriers, which is what you should expect. So that's the, um, I think I'm, oh, I'm still doing okay. Do I have right until the hour or should I stop 10 minutes early? Yeah. Early? Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, then I promise there will only be a couple more slides and we'll try to go through it. Um, so um, we were moderately satisfied with this, I would say. But the question I have for my students and for myself, because we, who doesn't like a good challenge, is this is nice that we can evolve forward this model, uh, this KMC model, but we still need to run these somewhat, sometimes relatively expensive simulations, sometimes not, to capture these defect energies, depending on the defect you're looking at, right? Is there a way we can actually predict it without even having to do this? So this is where we turn to uh, some statistical analysis to understand if we can somehow make a mapping between solute arrangement and the arrangement of the potential energy landscape or the fluctuations. So this is what we are considering, and we're still working on, I would say, for ordered systems, but we've kind of closed the book on random systems. So to understand this, first we have to consider where do these fluctuations arise from? And for that, I'm going to consider this relatively simple example of a universe that is only about 20 atoms or however many, uh, I should say, uh, 12 plus 6, 18 nearest neighbors in the first and the second shelf for an FCC material. We're only going to consider this binary system that is 18 atoms large, that um, we are what we're doing is partitioning the solute differently. So we're changing the overall composition. This is something you could encounter in a concentrated solution. And we're changing the partitioning of the solute at a constant concentration amongst the first and second neighbor shells. And we're looking at a very simple, not even defect energy, looking at the cohesive energy here. And what we see already from this simple argument is there are already meaningful fluctuations. Okay? What do you do with that? Well, it turns out, and again, the paper which is referenced, I, I left the key references slide somewhere else, the, um, the statistics of this can actually be analyzed analytically. Basically, um, you can make some arguments, and that's what's being shown through numerical simulation here, that you can predict if you know how many atoms you're sampling and you know the overall composition of the alloy that you're dealing with, and it's randomly arranged, you can predict with uh, an arbitrary number of elements, system, arbitrary composition, the statistics of the local environments that you might sample. And you can also predict the bonding environments that you might sample. So the pairing between first and second nearest neighbors or third nearest neighbors or what, whatever nearest neighbors you might be interested in. So this is with relatively modest uh, analysis, you can capture these statistics just from direct analysis. You don't need to do any fancy simulations. So that covers the chemical environment. But what do we do about the energetic environment, the energy? We need a map from chemical to energy. And this isn't um, necessarily a pioneer by our group, but I think we've made a meaningful contribution here, is what we need to do is we need a map. And what is a map in molecular static simulations or molecular dynamics? It's the interatomic potential. It, create, it maps composition to energy. The model that we're working with is relatively popular in metals, and there's some arguments about how accurate it is in multi-component systems. We're not claiming that we've solved these issues. All we're trying to do, at least with our humble analysis here, is say whatever we're overlaying on top of this doesn't introduce new errors. It just has any of the errors that are inherent to the underlying EAM relations that we're dealing with. But basically what we're doing is we're taking the EAM relations, so there's um, the embedded atom method relations, which have two terms, the embedding energy, so the energy that you get from the electron density at the site of the atom, and the pair potential energy that you get from the bonding between adjacent atoms. And we're reparameterizing these equations 
by introducing structure factors. And these structure factors contain the statistical information of the chemical environment for the alloy you're doing. So it's a relatively modest looking um, intervention that we've made here. And um, basically then all you need to predict defect energies and energies of atoms is you need information about the structure of your defect. So if your defect is fixed by symmetry, like you might have in a vacancy, there's some shell symmetry to it. Or in a planar fault, there is some symmetry that um, merges towards the bulk symmetry as you get further away from the planar fault. You can actually do an excess energy calculation and predict these fluctuations. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I'm realizing that I'm getting close on time. We can try this out for something as simple as cohesive energy. So here's the cohesive energy maps for an iron nickel chromium system, which is meaningful for us in terms of because it represented the stainless steel matrix. You can see that our model matches our ground truth, which is our molecular static simulations uh, very well. Um, the markers and the dashed lines on the left-hand side of this image. And then because we've got this good agreement, we can rapidly map out this ternary space of this alloy and create these nice ternary diagrams where we're uh, populating it with defect energies and standard deviations of defect energies as opposed to the normal phase diagrams that you might be familiar with. We can do this with vacancies. So this is something that we're still working on publishing. Mm -hmm. So what we've measured here is vacancy formation energies and vacancy migration energies injected that information about the structure factors of these vacancies at meaningful distances from the defect into our relations. And I've got to find a better way to present this because I'm not really satisfied at this point. But you, what you can see is our analytical relations match the molecular static relations, match some references with pretty satisfactory agreements. So what we've been able to do is remove the need to do sometimes these complicated or um, costly nudged elastic band simulations and replace it with an analytical method. And there are some limits on how accurate this is for some systems, but in most alloys, we found that this works quite well. We can also do this for planar fault energies and then rerun our kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. What we found with this is that there is some difficulty in matching, mapping the standard deviations. The average energies come up quite well. And that's not necessarily to do with anything wrong with the analysis. It's just you get these division by very small numbers that tend to blow up your air that propagate through these relations, which um, there's not really much we can do about, but it does give you a first, a good, very good first order approximation. So. I've got a couple conclusion slides here, but I guess I can refer to those if there are any questions, or maybe very briefly. This part of the talk, what have we shown? This KNC-based scale mechanics model, where we see this operating is at the, the space between atomistics and crystal plasticity. Hopefully this will be adopted by the community because frankly, I don't have the bandwidth to solve all the problems here. And it would be maybe a bit arrogant to think I could. The fluctuations do matter when the length scale of the defect that you're working with matches the length scale of the fluctuations inherently. And um, some of these defect energies with satisfactory accuracy can mapped out uh, rapidly by analytical relations that we've developed. So I don't think I have time to go to the last topic. Um, if anyone's interested in hearing more about that, it's a completely different topic. Uh, but thank you. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, I'd like to thank my students because, of course, they do a lot of the work themselves and of course our, our sponsors. Thank you everyone. <laughs>
based whether you varied the composition and you see a lot of. Uh... So, oh, in, in this here, we only looked at equimolar for this case. Yeah, yeah. But uh, conceivably, we could test out a lot of different uh, cases, just we would need to go rerun the calculations. Yeah, it would change the barriers, right? What is the relative energy of FCC versus HCP phase? Oh. At equimolar, it's, you know what? I have it somewhere else. I think this was equimolar. Um, yeah, so uh, purple here, the average barrier is somewhere in the 30 to 40 range, right here. And the first standard deviation gets you almost to HCP. Have you looked at it, what concentration of cobalt it becomes HCP? Oh, I mean, we did map out, actually I should show, okay, so I do have a slide for that. Good thing I have those conclusion slides in. So we did indirectly look at that. This is the um, cohesive energy of the phase in blue. Sorry, this is a really messy plot. Only focus on the blue. And the triangle is the HCP cohesive energy and the uh, square is the FCC cohesive energy. And right around above 60 to 65%, I would say, as you get that crossover, which if you look at the phase diagram is what you see as well. Um, but I think the nickel cobalt phase diagram is not really well you know, confidently constructed, but we we did this test and we were pretty satisfied with this. You're working very close to that. We're working point. close. It, if it, you worked at the lower side, like twenty percent, ten percent, would you still see local chemical relations? I think so. It's just it's a question of how the standard deviation changes. I think the the standard deviation. What you're going to get is the distributions are going to narrow as you get closer to pure elements, right? Um, so you would see the effect. But the reason we tested epping molar is because. The thought was that the scatter will be highest there just because the highest chemical scatter. Right? Thank you. Yeah, sir. Yes. Um, two questions. The thing you said about necking and deformation twinning, is that like a universal thing that if a, if a material undergoes deformation twinning, then they can avoid necking? I wouldn't want to say it's a universal thing. I would say within the continuum law of Considera's criterion, really what you care about is the work hardening rate. So if you work harden too fast, like if you just went, had a material that was purely elastic, it would fail at very low strain because of eventually the, the derivative, which is the elastic modulus, would hit the true stress, and then you would fail by this, by Considera's limit, which is usually pretty good. If you um, had perfect plasticity, you would stretch very, 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 very far, and, and in fact, I guess forever, Think about the math on that, but you just would never build up a lot of strength in the material, right? So what I'm saying about deformation twinning, and again, I don't have a good explanation for this, is in the materials that I looked up in the literature, it causes this magic of just a flat work hardening rate, a linear work hardening rate. So if I was drawing the stress drain curve, it would look like that. And if you look at most of the high performance steels like trip and twip or twip steels anyway, that's what their stress drain curve looks like. Um, that is magic in avoiding twinning because you're building up stress or in avoiding necking because you're building up stress, but you're not doing it so fast that you hit your, your true stress. So if you were plotting the derivative, it would kind of hit something like that. Titanium? Uh, I don't know enough about titanium, but um, it's HCP, right? Uh, my understanding in Thai 6.4 anyways, you're mostly concerned with HCP to BCC transformations, not necessarily HCP to FCC, but I don't know enough about the system. Okay. Um, I guess oh, we don't really, have to. I'm in the meeting after this. So I just want you to talk me through, but well, maybe I could sort of get started. So the last part of your talk, so, uh, it seems like I mean, understands this really well, but I am struck. I'm scared how much he understands this. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so chemistry changes the energetic competition between twinning and slip. Sorry, chemistry change. Yeah. Yes, right? yeah. Yeah. conceivably, so, yeah, yeah. So chemical heterogeneity changes it statistically. You know, like with a there's a distribution of chemistry yep. in neighborhood, and so there's a distribution of that competition. Who's yep. going to win out? Right. Why does that change? Why does it? Why does it not follow the average? Why does it? Because you're always finding the weakest spot to deform. 
Okay. The information is never the average. It's always your weakest yeah. link. Uh, to a first order hand wavy approximation. That's that's what it is. Right? Yeah. So it's finding the weak spots to nucleate and, a defect. And it's got to be able to access those weak spots. And that's yeah. where the length scale comes into play. Exactly. Because right. it might hit a weak spot, but then find a very, it, you know, once that dislocation is nucleated, it has to go along a contrived path. Mm -hmm. Unless it can possibly find a way out of it, it might hit a strong barrier. This is almost like is order and causing precipitation on it kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Do you think this has, is this like a, does it have tie-ins to the, some of the, you know, interesting properties of HEAs in general? Certainly, I hope so. That's what I'm staking a lot of my early research on. <laughs> um, but I'll be happy just by studying these fundamental problems. But yeah, I mean, uh, what's known about HEAs and why they got very attractive, I would say, in the first point is they have a very high solute hardening limit that has to do with the chemical environment. Now, how we understand, I would say, modestly, what that solute environment might do to the, to the stress to move a dislocation step by step by step. What we don't necessarily understand is when you have many dislocations interacting, how that will change the aggregation of defect mass, uh, deformation over at mesoscales. That's what we're trying to move towards. So mm -hmm. we have a maybe even a clumsy understanding of how that happens in pure metals, but certainly not in these compl complicated solute environments. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I guess the answer to the question is I'm not sure, but I think so because most of my training tells me it should. Do we have any questions from our Zoom audience? Uh, the Sheldon part two. So you showed class rain, you know, crystal grain. Yeah. Like, you know, like, like alternatives. What happens if you're like building? Is it, you never look at that? Um, it's a complex problem. Yeah. The problem is um, functionally grading it, right? Like that is not amenable to electrodeposition. Because what electrodeposition is good at making is sharp boundaries because you are turning on your power supply and then turning it off or, sh or flipping it on and off really quickly. If you try to gradually change the waveform, uh, what you'll do is you'll just grow one really long crystal. And I don't think we could, well, I, I shouldn't say that. We didn't really try to modulate the waveform enough because uh, we were really interested in these sharp interfaces. So it might be possible, but my intuition would tell me that if you try to do that, what you're going to find is what comes out. To be honest, electro that deposition is a bit of voodoo sometimes. What comes out uh, is going to be one really long crystal where you thought you were getting some sort of transition. All right, let's thank to our speaker.